I, I was actually, I started working in the space after my uh, undergraduate degree. Um, oh, there's my LinkedIn. Um, yeah, so I did a communication degree undergraduate, and then I went out into the field and worked for eight years. And my first job out of university, uh, actually within industry, was actually working at the Australian Broadcasting Commission. And I was a production secretary on a TV show, uh, which was, it seemed like a sort of mundane administrative work. But the thing was, because I was right in the middle of everything going on, lots of opportunities came my way where someone couldn't do anything. I could put my hand up and say, I can write that script. I can produce that segment. And so by the end of my first year, I, I was writing scripts for the show. I was producing segments, but I was still called a production secretary and still paid as a production secretary. But that's another story. But the experience that I gained from that was just amazing. And um, I went on to still working in television and then I moved to the other side of the country and ended up working in the nonprofit sector, which was really good and learned a lot there because in the nonprofit space, usually there is not a lot of money and, and the teams in marketing and communications are quite small. So you get to do a lot of different roles within that. So again, that really helped me to build my experience. And then I moved back to where I first came from and ended up uh, working in the um, education sector in marketing and communications and uh, looking after sort of different campuses and then research. So, uh, and I think it was that as a research communication manager where I got to go all over the university and um, tell stories of the amazing things that the researchers were, going, were, were doing and try to actually translate them into layman's terms, which was often very challenging, uh, but it helped me to learn how to communicate really clearly and simply and um, from that, I actually started to find out what research really was about. So it was through that role. And then before I knew it, I um, had did the work to get into a, a PhD. And then I was offered a small role as a, uh, an assistant lecturer. And then it sort of went on from there. So then my over time, my research interests developed in the social media space when I started to teach a public relations course around online public relations and communication. And then it's sort of gone from there. So then I ended up back again at the other end of the country where I've been, it's going up and down. And then uh, at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And when I got there, there was only one social media course and it was kind of, it was a bit outdated actually. And so I revamped it and then it started to grow in popularity. And then I was asked to create more and more. And um, yeah, so that's where I, I am now. And so my, my research has been very focused on that sort of space, like social media skills, how to teach social media, what employers want out of um, graduates in terms of social media skills. But it's sort of diversified a little bit as well, looking at um, like what just before today's session, I've, I've received some funding from a government department to do an investigation into the relationships between small business owners and digital marketing services providers, because there's some issues going on there. Um, and it's, uh, it, from my research, it's actually coming down to a communication issue where they're not communicating clearly enough. Or, um, they're not doing research either side and about each other before they go into this relationship and then issues arise. So um, it's amazing how communication and research can be, um, you know, issues and so important for any sort of relationship, really. So that's it in a nutshell. So it's been an interesting ride. Um, from when I first finished university. And you mentioned that intersection between public relations and social media, which I think in the handbook um, is sort of front and center because of the, the folks who wrote chapters all have, many of them have strong PR backgrounds. So one of the questions that we've, we've started these conversations with is when the call went out for the chapter, how did you kind of fit your research program to the idea of this chapter? Well, I think because I was really focusing, I, I, what I find interesting is the way that the role of social media has changed within organisations over time. And I wrote a little bit about it in a chapter in my own social media book, but I just thought this is a really good opportunity to, to really explore that in much greater depth and just see what else was going on. Also to draw in the research that uh, Karen Greberg uh, helped me with, with this as well, just focusing on, we mainly looked at Australian employers, but just what they actually want or expect in terms of skills relating to graduates in, in terms of social media. But we also looked at... Um, 
the what they deemed the most unprofessional social media behaviors as well which that was that was interesting too uh so yeah it's just this sort of idea of um, social media as a professional role and a profession in itself that's what interested me and I, I thought that would be a great um chapter to explore it further in great let's open it up to faith and your question for starters yeah, so I was wondering, um, what do you think are some current challenges that anyone working in social media like faces when it comes to building trust with their audience? Yeah, well, I guess it's um, it's about making sure the information you're communicating is correct and accurate. I think, um, as as most importantly, and being I guess transparent and consistent. I think the trend now is that it's about being genuine more than being polished um, in terms of the way you present yourself and we can see that with things like TikTok really gaining in um, in popularity and things like that so you know gone are the days where like the polished corporate video and the the, the talking head where they you know they were reading off a teleprompter and that was the the way now it's about sort of picking up your phone and just really pouring your heart out there and um, and being you know just speaking genuinely uh, so I think the more that people do that uh, online, I think that, that will build the trust. But I think also it's listening to what your your customers or prospective customers or anyone is really sort of saying before responding as well. Um, so if there is sort of an issue that crops up, it's actually reading what's going on and then reading the room <laughs> because we've seen how many organisations just don't do that very well. That's, they're already thinking of their response without listening or reading and really um, absorbing what people are saying, um, always trying to protect the reputation rather than actually listening to, to what people think. Um, you know, and there's, of course, there's limits to that. But yeah, I think it's um, really focusing on those core communication principles. And I think that's the thing that will build the trust. Trust is so important and it's come up, I think, repeatedly in our discussions in this uh, semester. Cecily? Yeah, so I was actually, um, you highlight the like three stages of social media, um, like as waves kind of, and I've done some social media work for like small businesses. And I was curious um, for those small businesses that are still maybe operating at like the first and second stage, what would you like what advice would you give to them on how they can maybe advance to the next stage if they don't necessarily have that budget to hire on like a whole team or what have you yeah i guess i guess it's really to focus on what is working now to bring in new business and just to focus on that um and really and keep doing that to build in more because the growth is where they'll be able to actually bring on more people to do more so um, rather than being everywhere and, and trying to do everything, um, it's actually just really doubling down on the stuff that's already working and, um, and using that and leveraging that and getting that right to bring in more people. And then they'll be able to sort of diversify and do a little bit more. I think sometimes business owners think they have to be everywhere. Um, that's the key to success, but it's not. It's really about building that, that audience um, who are really engaged with you. And whether that's on one platform or two in the beginning, you know, I think that's enough. And then over time, you'll be able to expand that. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Yeah, so uh, my question is, so uh, in, in many occasions in the, in the chapter, it's mentioned that many organizations, they want to show their presence in the social media. So, my question is, do we have any uh, re recent research or study which, which shows that instead of simply having their presence in the social media, they are actually getting profits by showing their presence in the social media? Well, it really depends on how you set it up. So, And it depends what your goal is from the beginning. So uh, you need to work out how you're going to measure that before you do it. So... It, but if it's like trying to drive um, people from social media to your website to then call, you know, um, fill in a form or subscribe or make an appointment or things of that nature, like you need to be able to track what's that that's doing. So it really depends on the activities that you're, you're doing on social media. 
um, and making sure that you set up that way to track it before you know you start to try and measure. Otherwise, you, you, it'll be very hard to measure that. It's like looking at your advertising and and working out what the goal is of that, and then tracking that it's actually you're actually meeting that goal. So, yeah. So I think it's really in how how you know what you're trying to achieve and how you do it. And what have you found works in that area in terms of being strategic, having planning, uh, having goals, tactics? What can you give us an example where where yeah, that's really so worked for, well? For example, so we we try sometimes to um, like because I have a digital marketing agency. So sometimes we, if we've got the time, like we'll run some ads to get people to set up appointments with us to talk about their social media needs and. And we give them sort of a free audit and then um, guide them on what our services are. So the initial goal would be to get those appointments set up. The next goal would be what happens after those appointments. So if someone signs up for, say, a $3,000 coaching package, then we can go, okay, well, based on how much we spent on the ads, like this has been the return because from that, someone's actually bought um, that. So there are other factors at play, though. So the ads have helped, but also... You know, the ads might bring in the the uh, the meetings and there's the one-on-one meetings, but we might be really bad in the meeting. <laughs> so, so that's not saying social media is not working. That's saying we're not doing a great job. So, um, yeah, so there's different factors in play. So it's just really working out, you know, with your social media activities, what it is you're trying to achieve. Another thing um, some people do is they will, I've seen this with some food um, sort of businesses on the Sunshine Coast where I live, they might just put up, as I say on Instagram, a, a new, like if say it's a donut shop, they might put up a new type of donut and they only put it on their Instagram and um, then they see how many, they don't show it in the store or anything and they say something like you need to come in and ask for this particular donut and um, then they can track how many people come in and actually buy that donut because they, and they've only put it on Instagram so then they can they can track that way so it's none of it's foolproof but uh you know there are certain things you can do different tactics you can use to try and then track if people are coming into a store or they're they're doing like achieving the 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 action that you're trying to get them to do great jacob so um the chapter talks about um specialist team members for social media um members like they're focusing on one aspect of the social media process it's like community manager strategist copywriter videographer and so on and so forth as we transition out of a post-covid world how do you think that these specialist team member roles within social media will evolve over time yeah that's a good and i guess it depends on the growth of the company so I've only sort of come to and seen this with some um, sort of agencies that I know it's also organisations where as they're, they've realised how effective their social media has been to bring in business or leads or for their, or say for their clients, if it's an agency, um, then they've realised they need to, you know, do more. They might get more clients or they want to um, be on more channels or, you know, it, it just depends on the nature of the business. So just say they video is, um, they need to create more video, then they might bring on more, more video people. Um, so, and it depends on their services. So it's hard to say, it, it really depends on the, the business, but we've seen in the last, you know, couple of weeks, what's happened with some of the major platforms in terms of digital. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be really interesting because there was a real big boom, of course, throughout COVID where so many people needed to do um, have increased their, their online presence because they couldn't actually get people to, you know, come come and into their business face to face or only for short periods. Uh, but but yeah, from I know like from my experience, it is it is still growing, but it's it's just hard to say what what's going what's going to happen. It depends on the success of the business because I think for a business to survive, they have to be quite flexible, particularly in their hiring purposes so they might need people for a while or or, or and not um maybe they'll outsource more so have more sort of freelancers they might bring on when they need to and then sort of let go so maybe that's how things will change a bit um but I, I remember that like even I think in that chapter I had to look at it again um when I was writing it they were saying you know voice is going to be the next next big thing and and it was sort of going that way for a little while now it's really slowed right down um so you know, he who even knows how how that's that's going to go. So that was like a 
communication sort of channel that people or, or style that people were or content style that people were really getting behind but now you know so then there might have been people employed in that space and now it's sort of eased a bit so but they mightn't have any as much work in there anymore um so it depends on I guess what people are consuming in terms of content thank you thank you Lauren um something that's happened in probably the last year a little bit more so is that companies have started social media companies have started to like pick up different what were previously unique attributes of the platform and kind of brought them into their own. I'm thinking of like TikTok and YouTube Reels. How has that affected the job of the social media manager since previously they may have had to di diversify? Is that something that they still have to do yeah. that since there may now be more consistency in content across platforms? Yeah, it's a hard one because even there are different types of audiences on different platforms. Um, and But it really comes back to I guess who like the the brand you're representing or or the target audience you're trying to communicate with where where are they? Um, so I know um, some some social media managers have great processes where say it's a they start off with a TikTok video then they repurpose it as a reel and a YouTube short so it's across there but that that's good but you have to sort of keep in mind um, I guess what is most popular on each of the platforms and who the audience is whenever you're doing that. So you may need to sort of tweak that content as well to sort of, to make sure it suits that. I know with, um, I know Instagram Reels tries to be TikTok. I, I'm a big um, TikTok fan, but they try to be TikTok. But what I find with Instagram Reels, it tends to be like a really nice sort of aesthetic looking um, sort of interiors. It still, it still has that sort of, um, sort of designer sort of, um, feel about the content there whereas a TikTok sort of picking up the phone when you don't have any makeup on uh, you know in the you know in the middle of the night telling a story or something um may not go so well on Instagram reels as like on TikTok you can just sort of tell stories wherever um it's very much based on that so yeah so I think um it, it's good to have a presence on each of the platforms if that's where your audience is but you'll still need to sort of tweak it a little bit I think to suit it Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And, and students think about if you have follow up questions. Uh, I have one. So we're getting near the, the end of the handbook, which has gotten us to readings about bots and artificial intelligence and ethics. And the first part of this maybe two part question is public relations has been concerned for a long time about ethics. Uh, it would appear to be becoming more complicated as we get into non-human agents in these social spaces. What's happening in Australia? I mean, what have you looked at in this regard? Um, can the codes of ethics help us? Or are, are we kind of uh, headed toward a, a more confusing time within social media spaces? Yeah, I mean, it's a good it's a good question. There hasn't been a lot of talk about it here, particularly around AI and things of that nature. And when we talk about AI, AI, it tends to be more around things like content generation and um and things of that nature, like you know, copywriting and and things like that. Um, I remember that. I mean, in, in, I remember when sort of a few years ago when chatbots were huge, like that was the that was you know the the, the trends that was really huge and. I remember there was issues around ethics there saying, you know, you, you'll need to say that the person is not speaking to a real person and, and they're actually talking to a chatbot and there were those sorts of issues at play. Um, but yeah, there's, there isn't at this stage a lot, a lot of talk about it, but I think, I, I think maybe as it does become more prevalent, like the, I think maybe the um, code of ethics needs to sort of be re revisited to make sure that everything in there, you know, it, it sort of covers all of the new technologies as well. What have been some of the issues over in the States that have come up with PR and, and ethics and, and new technologies? I mean, I think you you capture it quite well. There's more theory than practice. And, and that was the second part of my question, which is there's a chapter in there about pedagogy and kind of learning and training. And my sense is, that this technology is moving pretty quickly, but 
the academy might struggle to keep up with it because of a lack of, of, of really understanding it and being able to utilize it. Yeah, and I mean, we we talk about sort of sort of day to day issues and things, you know, like the metaverse and um, NFTs and, and things like that. But we're not sort of building them and creating them, but we just talk about them as concepts and what that might do to impact culture and society and things of that nature. So we are sort of across it. We've had opportunities for students to build chatbots and things before. Um, in terms of like sort of AI generated content. We do talk about that, but we also talk about sort of the drawbacks of it as well, um, because I don't, I still don't think it's there yet. We also talk about AI in the sense of, say, when um, on, say, Facebook, um, there's sort of mis or disinformation shared or um, violent content and things like that, and and how, the again, the, um, the AI technology is not good enough yet for it to pick up everything, and that's a constant issue of, of um, and not even just on Facebook, even on TikTok and things that you know platforms just not being able to pick up this sort of um, you know content, damaging content before too, so many people see it. So yeah, so we just we still we we do talk about the issues, but actually hands on teaching them, um, we're still a little bit away as well, I think. And Lauren and Rama, I think, have been working on disinformation and AI, any any thoughts from you in terms of questions you have uh, in terms of getting a different perspective on all of this? No, no, no professor has a counsel like. Um, this is kind of getting into the paper I brought up for this, um, for our discussion after this. Sorry, Dr. Sutherland, you will not be a part of that. Um, but it was talking about, um, oh, what was it? The specific word I've written down, but essentially that content will be created automatically based on um, things that are going on in the, with the intent to manipulate the public mood. Um, how do you think that this is going to be a potential issue that like, oh, that was algorithmically generated, there we go, content? Um, do you think that that's going to be an issue or do you see that as still something like that's kind of off in the future or maybe it already is here? Yeah, like, I mean, I what I think about all of that is that it's about really educating the users because I think it will be a problem as long as, you know, I mean, we, we, we learn as kids how to show that, say, a movie isn't real. You know, so we need to also educate people using social media about what the systems do and, you know, how how to try and decipher between what is accurate and not and, and those sorts of things. So I think as long as um, that's not happening, I think anything to do with sort of what the content that algorithms are, are showing to us is going to be an issue for sure. Um, because I think some people are still really swayed, like I could only talk about my mum, like... <laughs> I have to like you know like now she at least she checks in with me before she shares something to see and I'm like no 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 don't no, don't share that don't share that but it only takes people who just believe everything they see on social media to keep sort of sharing it and that that sort of makes it move you know sort of travel further as well um so I think yeah I think it will be an issue as long as there's still that sort of lack of education around what is shared I was speaking earlier this morning to business students down at Creighton University, a few miles uh, toward downtown from here, and they are quite concerned about Elon Musk and the turmoil at Twitter. What's your perspective on that? Well, it's been very um, entertaining. Um, <laughs> <laughs> gee, um, I, I don't like. He clearly doesn't know what he's doing so he, i'm just you just don't know what's going to happen what's happening going to happen today you know so his idea is to clean it up but then he's um removed all the the, the content moderators so um, i'm not sure you know what is what is going to happen um and if it will even stay afloat so uh yeah i don't i don't yeah i just don't think he knows, he knows what he's doing oh uh, he's and i find him i nearly had a, a linkedin argument discussion um the other day with someone uh, because I wrote an article about 
how he um, he sacked all the um, fired all the moderators, and then all the a- advertisers were like, "Well, we're we're not staying here because there's no content moderation. We we don't want to be associated with whatever Twitter's going to turn into without that sort of um, quality control." And then he was on um, Twitter Spaces begging for them to come back. And, uh, and yeah, so this person, um, yeah, they just, they think he's wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what how it's all actually going to play out in the end um, with, with him. I think he's a very, he acts very impulsively. And, I mean, that's how he even came to say he was going to buy Twitter. Um, and then he tried to get out of it. And then it's a similar thing. He's, he, you know, all the advertisers leave based on something he did and then he's begging them to come back. So who who knows? Um, maybe he, it will turn around and be back to where it started in the next couple of weeks because, he's, you know, he realised he can't do what he actually thought was a good thing. Um, yeah, he doesn't seem to think through <laughs> his actions. So I don't know. It's like it's his expensive little toy, I think. Well, um, I think I called it the most the the biggest impulse buy in history, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do wonder, you were talking earlier about the importance of TikTok, and there's some data now that suggests um, you know, it's it's become an important source for news. Uh, there hasn't always been great content moderation in TikTok during the no. pandemic. Um, what are the prospects there for, um, you know, if, if that's the model going forward for social media platforms to copy, that we're actually going to be able to use this in any way for kind of democratic conversation? Because in this country, you know, newspapers have been in decline uh, television news seems to be hanging in there, uh, but but often television news isn't about sort of depth and conversation as much as um, kind of the story of the day. Uh, is it that way there as well? Well, I think it sort of gives people the ability to talk to each other and respond to each other and to create content, their own content about the news that's going on. So while there are like there's many sort of official news outlets that have a presence on there. Uh, often you get just everyday people who found an article that was interesting and then they give their take on it. So um, I think it sort of opened up conversations with people who who were not sort of journalists um, or experts in the field. But again, that, that can also um, sort of add to disinformation as well, particularly if that person isn't qualified um, to sort of make comment like you can always make a comment but not but it's not always fact like there's a difference sometimes well a lot of the time between fact and opinion um but I think it just allows that conversation a bit more and it allows people to to share their feelings about a particular issue where which traditional media doesn't really do that so much and I think even on things like Facebook like it's um it, it, I, I don't think people go there for that like I just I don't I think people just sort of scroll past they want to see what Um, their family and friends are doing more so than talk about you know really um, issues and important news topics as much Um, so I think yeah I think I mean it's good in a way it sort of allowed people to have a voice and and share their thoughts on on world events sorry I'm having trouble yeah go ahead um, you had mentioned earlier about how what seems to be more interesting for people is um, accounts that are more honest, not necessarily or very genuine than necessarily being a cookie cutter. In the last probably since the pandemic has started, I've noticed that there are some accounts for corporations that, for lack of a better term, are chaotic or unhinged in their content, um, but they seem to get a lot of attention. Do these kind of accounts that do this very chaotic, odd um, content that they put out, does that, I guess this is kind of more of like an insider, like does that, do people within the social media managers within the industry feel that that reflects poorly on the rest of the corp, on the rest of the profession, or is that just they're getting attention, so it doesn't matter, they're doing well? 
Yeah, I think I think it's I guess it also comes comes back to their branding. So if that sort of style is sort of how they communicate their brand voice and it fits in um, with their branding, then I think that it's it's okay. It also is sort of that shock value because it sort of goes against what other brands are doing. So it gets people's attention in that way. But it just makes me wonder how long that'll work because um, at the moment it's you know, something new, but then it might just get a bit tired um, if if it's they do the, the same thing all, all the time, but it's more about the shock value than the, the actual information being conveyed. So just making sure that, that, you know, there is an actual message there rather than just getting people's attention. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder, you know, with the success of, of you know, people like Elon Musk, because uh, he has a lot of followers on Twitter before, he decided to buy it and and before him donald trump before he was booted from twitter uh during the january 6th incident i just wonder whether people are just kind of following that as, as now as a path that is considered a legitimate way to attract attention to just be as controversial as you can possibly be and see what kind of a reaction you get yeah but i, I think too it seems to be people who have um like they tend to have a, some sort of platform or profile before like you, you know what I mean so they're, they're sort of known for that I think if I started to do that people would be like who what is going on here they, they I think they just leave you know in, in droves going what's you know she's having a crisis but I think with them um, with some people I think um yeah they that, that's sort of aligned with their personality um and I think people often follow them not because they like them but because they I guess they like the um, spontaneity of what they do and so they just want to be entertained and they just they just follow them to see what they're going to do next because they're so erratic um so yeah I think that's my feeling on that but I think if every everybody so it would work with some people but I think with other people it, it wouldn't it really wouldn't this isn't true of all of our states but some of our states, such as California, uh, Illinois, Florida, are increasingly enacting uh, regulation to try to protect data privacy, uh, online privacy. I think that might be a trend there as well. Yeah, and I think it's become it's going to be even more more so. I think because just the. Um, and I think it, it stems really like the big first really big issue came around the 2016 election um, in the US um, and what was it Cambridge Analytica like creating ad like gathering data um, unethically and I think to yeah I don't think people understand how much data is gathered on on us every day from you know even I have a, a Fitbit watch like even that I don't know why anyone would be interested but you know, like people are just gathering and, and it's all really clearly mainly for advertising and, and targeting in that way, particularly on the social platforms. Um, so, yeah, so I think it, it, it will, like there'll be some sensitive things on there, but it makes me think there is so much data that uh, it's going to become harder and harder to really do a lot with it. Like we'd have to, the things that we use to, to gather it are also going to have to evolve as well to cope with just the volume of, of the big, data sets that are that are coming out yeah and i don't think that maybe maybe this is a third person effect but i don't think the average user has a, a complete sense of of the footprint that we all leave in these online spaces i was telling you uh right as we were logging in before all the students got here that mark smith at the social media research foundation and the node xl project was experimenting with this Twitter 2.0 uh, API, which allows now to go back and get historical data for registered academics. And, and we were looking at some data that my students are using for the Douglas County Health Department. And I just sort of casually said, so Mark, uh, do I understand you that you could go back and get like my historical uh, Twitter data? And about 24 hours later, he came back uh, I'll show the students this later with a map that took my tweets all the way back to 2009. Yeah, wow. um, and, and there they all are. It's like my entire presence on Twitter, 
you know, for over a decade. And, and it, you know, it took a while to collect that big data and process it, but it wasn't that hard to do now. And, you know, so I think that's always been the case behind the scenes. The platforms have had access to the data. The advertisers have used the data. I mean, the optimistic thing would be that we'll all be able to have a little more transparency uh, with what's there and what's not. Yeah, I, and I think I think that's important. Um, and I think even you've seen recently with uh, things like you know the app, Apple iOS update a few updates ago, where people could switch off if they wanted to be tracked off um, platforms like Facebook. Um, so there, it's becoming. Um, I guess we're getting a bit more control over how platforms are using our, our um, data um, in that way. So I mean, Facebook ads now aren't as a Effective. Well, we don't. We can't track them as well as we used to. Uh, so, if um, particularly if like your goal with a Facebook ad is to get someone to open a website or a web page, we only the people who are allowing that sort of tracking, if they're doing it on their phone, will um, you'll be able to actually know how well that's performed. Um, so you can only sort of then I guess look at say Google Analytics and just sort of see where people are coming from, but actually there's lots of holes in it now to actually really understand how well it's working um so yeah and even facebook uh when you're creating like um certain ads and you want to include different interest types for your audience they've reduced that number now for certain things so even um, they're reducing how well you can use their data to target people too yeah and and they also limited the the geo uh, demographic data, particularly during political campaigns that would limit, for example, a candidate for Congress targeting one message to one group of voters and, and another message to another. Yeah. Are there any questions that we should have asked you in, in the preceding 40 or so minutes uh, that you think uh, we should talk about? Oh, I, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea. So I guess uh, what I find it, I, I like is there are so many different types of social media research going on. Uh, even in this class, uh, there are so many different aspects of it. Um, so yeah, I, I have no I, no idea. Like I'm more interested in what you're doing, <laughs> so um, and where your what your plans are for when you finish. Um, do you, would you like to go around? To, if you don't have any plans, that's okay too. So. Um, does anyone want to tell me what they they think they might do? I think that's a great question. So let's let's chat from that perspective. Where do you go with all of this? Um, I work. I personally work in. So I work at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. We have the only sanctioned by the government counterterrorism center. Um, and so I very much over the last three years that we've been having this have been turned an eye to prevention and how creating policies and thinking forward about what this could, what the impact of this could be of a particular technology. So, you know, that's part of why my research I'm focusing on virtual reality is recognizing how much more depth and connection you can get um through that space instead of through just like a screen and thinking through okay what is what are the potential harms of this what do we need to be thinking about um and what you know we can talk to companies about like hey these are procedures you should probably put in place because xyz um it's a really interesting space to be in and i yeah yeah oh, absolutely and it and, and it's going to even just keep growing in importance as well um, particularly, you know, with them, um, I don't know how Zuck Mark Zuckerberg, I don't think it's moving as quickly as he wants it to, but you know, he I think his vision is to have everyone working in the workspaces in the metaverse uh, pretty quickly. So even that in itself is going to raise a lot of um, issues in the workplace. So yeah, so now that's an interesting space. Would anyone else like to share what their their plans may be? If not, it's okay. Does anyone have any questions about maybe entering um, 
the social media space as a, as a profession or anything around that? I mean, I have one that that is related to where we started this, that, you know, you as a professor have this this presence um, within social media. Do you do you face any pushback from your colleagues from your university? Do they embrace uh, that that you're out there in these public spaces? Um, I mean, I know a lot of universities put a lot of money into their communications office and their messaging. And I sometimes have felt like um, the fact that I have a little bit of a following on Twitter is, is maybe not all of a positive thing in the sense that, you know, uh, it, it could distract from uh, the larger organizational messaging. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think they just got used to it and I've been doing it for a long time now so and I think it really started when I started to build those social media courses and while I was always active sort of personally there were some platforms I hadn't really used very much before and I and I was thinking how can I even teach I can't teach people how to use this if I'm not out there myself so that was the key driver so learning by doing and then then I could actually really teach with some authority about you know what works and and how things function so on a practical level um but then you know just making sure I I, I think they're happy with me because I'm, I'm building a following I'm I'm talking positively about the university I'm showing more around what we're actually doing as well so that helps to attract um students as well and PhD students so uh you know I think in the beginning there was a, a little bit um because they didn't understand what I was sort of doing but now they sort of they're just sort of used to it now so sometimes they actually contact me and say can you share this so um so they they sort of got me on board and I think it helps with the um who's in charge of the marketing department as well so we've got a new marketing director and he's um sort of picks out people who are you know different researchers who are you know are posting on social media about their research and and leverages that whereas others yeah rather than um sort of thinking, uh, being scared of what we're going to say, they actually trust us, which is good. And even now, like we're actually doing a research communication strategy for the university and they put a call out to academics who wanted to be part of that. So uh, so I'm even involved on that committee now. So um, I guess really sort of using the expertise within the university, um, as well as like people who are professional staff, but also researchers themselves. I think they've, they've got a really good approach to that now. But yeah, it wasn't always it wasn't always the case. 